the budget SP08 tool changer project is back with part three. Today we fix Sobol's broken clipper installation and redo our tool head wiring with the Bird's Nest USB hub designed for this exact purpose. This installment of the build, I'm pleased to report, took nowhere near as long as it did between parts one and two. This is a team effort and the draft shift guys are making some great ground on adapting the coupling mechanism. But that's in the future because today we're fixing Sobel's mishap. Clipper can't be updated. The shenanigans started when I tried to install the companion component for OctoApp. This worked perfectly on several other Clipper machines but on the SV08, I got an error for a missing component that I could search for and verify was present. So next, I ran the script for Clipper Installation and Update Helper, pre-installed on the SV08, and selected Update. And what I found is that when I would select a component to update, it would go through the motions and everything seemed to be fine, but back on the Update menu, the old version would still be listed. The update just wasn't taking place properly, and I went through several cycles of this before I googled, and discovered this conversion guide to mainline Clipper by Rapator. There's a team of nine contributors that have laid out step-by-step -step instructions for reinstalling all of the software and firmware needed to give us full control of Clipper on the SV08. It seems like there's a lot here, but pretty much you just have to be able to follow things step-by-step. -step. And I will echo what they say here, and that this video guide will become out of date at some stage, so use it as a general reference, but please refer to what's on this page as your primary source of information. Remember the aim of this project is to make the conversion as simple as possible and reversible as well. So with that in mind, let's proceed. Let's quickly understand what we're dealing with here. This is the main board for the SV08 and it's an all-in-one board, the equivalent of a Raspberry Pi and a traditional 3D printer main board combined into one unit. On the left hand side, we have the MCU like we would find on the 3D printer main board. And on the right hand side, we have the processor for our single board computer, just like we would have on a Raspberry Pi. Another point of interest here is the eMMC. This is a storage device that holds the operating system for the 3D printer, just like we use an SD card for this with a Raspberry Pi. But this CB1 board also has a micro SD card slot as well as the eMMC. So we can actually choose which of these we wanna to use to run the printer from. My first recommendation is that you retain the standard eMMC with the old operating system intact as a backup. In this video, you're going to see me use an SD card to install the operating system onto, but alternatively, you could buy an additional eMMC and run the new operating system off that. Just keep in mind that if you do go for this option, you'll need to spend additional money in buying a programmer like you see here. An additional piece of hardware that you'll definitely need is a programmer for the MCU. That includes the MCU on the main board, as well as the MCU in each of the tool heads because Sovol did not include a bootloader, so that Clipper firmware is stuck too without this programmer. The programmer I ordered was a cheap clone. It did make things more complicated, but this is a one-off use, so I didn't mind. If you're planning on doing this type of thing a lot, perhaps go genuine for a smoother experience. In terms of software, we will be connecting and running commands via SSH. I'm still using PuTTY for this, it's free and simple and I've got a video and written guide for beginners on my website. We'll also be using FTP software to transfer files between the printer and our local computer. For this, I use WinSCP, it's free and easy to use. Finally, we need to flash an image to the SD card, and for this, Belina Etcher, also free and easy to use. Onto the guide, and please make sure to read all of the preliminary notes. And the first thing we need to do is to create a backup of our Clipper config files from the SV08. There's a lot of files here, so we don't want to do them one by one. Instead, in main sale, let's tick all and then click download, and then we'll get a nice zip with all of them wrapped up together. After the download, unzip these somewhere safe on your computer. So on to step one, removing the old eMMC. All we need to do is power down the printer, take off the bottom cover, and then unscrew it. After you've removed the bottom protective panel, we'll see the eMMC, and we can use a Phillips head screwdriver to remove the two retaining screws. After that, we simply pull it outwards to unplug it. Step two is flashing the Linux operating system image to the CB1. And as I mentioned earlier, I went for method three, which is running everything from the SD card. And that means starting on method two, but then stopping at a specific step. To get the OS image, we can click through to the Big Tree Tech GitHub, scroll down and then get the minimal version. 
and on the chance that Big Tree Tech release a future update that breaks compatibility, there's also a link to a specific version known to be working at this stage, which happens to be the one that I used. We now open Balina Etcher, select the image file we just downloaded, and then select our SD card, make sure you get this right and don't wipe any hard drives. After that, we simply click flash. There's a few stages to this, but they were all pretty fast and all up decompressing, flashing, and then validating took only a few minutes. When you're done, Windows will try and format the new SD card, but don't let it do it. It's simply Windows not recognizing the Linux operating system. So just click cancel and ignore any errors about drives being unavailable. If you had purchased a second eMMC and are using that instead of an SD card, you're going to have different or additional steps. But if like me, you're running directly off the SD card, we can skip directly down and now work from step three. There's a file that we first need to collect by following the link, clicking on the file and then clicking the download icon. Part of the SD card called boot should be accessible from Windows. We're gonna to come to it and open DTB all winner. We'll then paste in the DTB file that we just downloaded. In the root directory, there's a file called boardenv.txt. Copy that as a backup to somewhere else, and then open the original file in an editor like Notepad++. This step looks confusing, but it's not. We're simply going to copy the text in the gray box, scroll down to the bottom where there's two lines about root. We'll then select everything above them, delete this text, and paste in the text we just copied from GitHub. This step is customizing the operating system to suit the SV08. Now we're going to open and edit the file called system.cfg. There's a section here named Wi-Fi and you need to enter your SSID and password so the printer can connect to your network. If you're running Clipper screen like me, the line above needs to be uncommented and then the KS angle change from normal to inverted. Once we've done this, we can save the file. Looking to the future, the boot text will be upside down, but Clipper screen will be the correct way thanks to this change. We can now eject the SD card and place it into the printer's main board. Or if instead you're using an eMMC, you would install it now. We can turn the printer on, ready to connect via SSH. Step four is to install Clipper and all of its components via SSH. And we can see that the image we just flashed has a login BQ and password BQ. If you ever plug back in the old eMMC, the old username and password were both Sobol, whereas now they're both BQ. Step four is really easy. We just copy the commands one at a time, paste them into the terminal and hit enter to run them. This will do things like update the operating system packages, install Git, and then Clipper installation and update helper. We're then given a specific order to install the various components that make up Clipper. And this is really easy via this interface. Generally, we just go for any default options unless we're told otherwise in the guide. The only deviation is if you're running Clipper screen where you do that before Crow's Nest. Beyond that, this is super straightforward and an excellent and useful tool. One more thing, if you want to run the G-Code shell command extension, we can also install this at the same time. From the menu, we enter option 4 to go to advanced, and then option 8 to install this. At some stages, you'll need to reboot the printer. After you've done this, wait for it to boot and reconnect again via SSH. This is not complicated, we just work our way through the list, copying and pasting commands to install the required components. Step five is gonna see us add some files to the operating system. We've got two sets to get. The first are Serval add-ons, and we need to download ProPressure and Z Offset Calibration Python files. These will be copied into Clipper, Clippy, Extras. We connect to the printer using WinSCP, navigate to this folder, select the two files from our computer, and then press upload. Now for step two, we follow the link to get the following listed files, and again using WinSCP, Transfer them to printer data slash config. Right at the start, we backed up our printer config. So we want to come into that and copy the addresses for each MCU and then come into the newly uploaded printer config and paste them in place. We can now save and restart the printer. There's some more little tips about setting up Orca Slicer and that will complete our installation of the operating system. Some points on our progress so far. Firstly, this is an excellent guide. So thanks to everyone who contributed. Secondly, when the documentation comes out for the whole build, converting to mainline Clipper is going to be step number one. And thirdly, when we do get to that point, I think it's possible to have all of this done on a pre-configured SD card image. At this point, you should have a familiar problem. We've got the newest version of Clipper on the operating system, but the MCU Clipper firmware is older and therefore refuses to connect. So it's time to use our ST-Link programmer to update everything. Our first step is actually to back up the firmware on the MCU so we can restore it and reverse everything later if we want. 
please note that if something goes wrong or if you lose your firmware backup, there's a link to some uploaded backups on the GitHub. Let's proceed. And an important note to highlight here is that anytime we're connecting the SD link to the printer, the printer needs to be powered off. To go with our programmer, we need a piece of software. If you have a genuine one, you can follow the first link, but if you've got a clone like me, you might need to follow the advice on this page and download the older version. Either way, wiring the programmer to the printer is exactly the same. Both the mainboard MCU as well as the toolboard MCUs are going to have the following pins labelled. Here's the diagram for the mainboard and the diagram for the toolboards. All we need to do is look at the labelling on the programmer to find those pins, plug in some jumper cables, and then on the toolboard or mainboard MCUs, plug in the jumper cables to match the instructions. To get my clone programmer to work, I needed to use the older ST-Link utility and come up to target and then settings. I then had to plug the programmer in and keep hitting refresh until a serial number was displayed and sometimes this took a few goes. I'd also recommend setting the mode to connect under reset and the reset mode to hardware reset. And then up in the top left, we can click connect to target, which should display the current MCU's firmware on the screen. To make our backup, we need to set the size to 0x20,000. And when we hit enter, it will read 128 kilobytes of the flash exactly. We can now click the save icon and save the binary file somewhere on our computer. Remember to do this for the main board as well as the tool heads. For the next part, we're going to turn the printer on and connect via SSH to install the catapult bootloader, which means in future updates, we won't need the programmer. Like earlier, these steps are just a matter of copying the commands, switching to SSH and hitting enter to run them. There's a section that should look familiar if you've ever set up Clipper before, and all we need to do is match the settings in the picture. We then compile the bootloader and use WinSCP to connect to the printer, locate the output, and then copy it over to our computer. Once we've done this, we can turn the printer back off. It's time to connect the programmer back to the various MCUs just like we did earlier, although this should be the last time. Back in our programming software, we're going to click to load a binary and then select catapult.bin that we just retrieved with WinSCP. We'll then come up to the top left, select full chip erase and then confirm this will wipe the flash memory on the MCU. And finally, select Program Verify. Double check we have the Catapult binary selected and then click Start. The programming is over after a second or so. And you should see in the output, references to CAN boot as well as Catapult. These steps need to be repeated for the mainboard MCU as well as each toolhead MCU. And use the same catapult.binary file for each. We're on the very last step, using that bootloader to flash clipper to all of our MCUs. And to do this, we need to turn the printer back on. The most efficient way for this next part is to have all of your individual tool heads plugged in and ready to go. Our first step is going to retrieve the serial IDs for each of our MCUs. And if you're following this guide to set up a tool changer, you'll need it for every single tool head. I covered how to work out multiple IDs in my last video, and there's a step-by-step -step guide on the GitHub instructions too. We're going to follow the link to download the automatic MCU script update and then copy this file over to the Clipper directory. We need to make a simple edit to this file and we have two options. We can do it via SSH by using nano, or we can use the inbuilt editor in WinSCP by simply double clicking the file. Anywhere where we have a series of X's, we need to replace them with our specific serial IDs. We're gonna copy everything after the underscore and then paste this into the document, starting with the host or mainboard MCU. We come back to our printer config and now get the address for the first toolhead. This now gets pasted next to toolhead serial. If you're setting up a tool changer and have multiple toolheads, you'll get them one after each other and paste them into this script with a space in between them. With this done, we can now save the document. From here on in, we just follow the instructions by running commands. Using the reference picture, we match all of the settings when prompted. The mainboard clipper firmware will then be compiled and then flashed using the ID we edited into the script. We'll then set up the toolhead firmware by matching the settings in the picture once more before this too is compiled and then flashed to each of the toolheads. Once all of the toolheads are done, clipper will be restarted and if everything's gone well, back in the web interface, we should be connected successfully to every MCU. The beauty here is that for future updates, we just gotta run this same script again and everything will be automatic. So it is more convenient and we now have a vanilla version of Clipper that we can modify as we need to. In part two, we wired up four additional tool heads. But since then, I've wanted to redo it because I was unhappy with the amount of wires needed and also unhappy with the cable management at the USB hub. 
In summary, we had to extend the cable for the original tool head, run four separate 24 volt and ground cables up to the new ones, USB plus a separate five volts up to the hub, and then a new USB cable from the hub to each of the new tool heads. At the same time that my video was released, Ushix Tech also released this bird's nest USB hub for tool changes. It is fully open source with everything on GitHub, including a thorough manual going over all of the functions, pins and wiring. And on top of that, there's already a two part magnetic case designed by Mancheater. So while it cost me US $65 after I had already paid and fitted the other USB hub, this is a massive upgrade and you'll soon see why. Let's start by comparing the wiring. And now we have a single 24 volt and USB up to the bird's nest, and then a single all-in-one cable from there up to each tool head. Furthermore, with this system, we can actually have a six tool head. And thanks to the onboard MCU, we have a bunch of additional ports that we can use for thermistors, neopixels, or filament runout sensors. I ordered the board plus a USB-C cable. It came really quickly and had everything provided that I needed. And that includes all of the connectors and pins required for crimping any cables. I modified my previous extrusion mount for the old hub, adding some holes to bolt the two together. And I modified the top to add some piano wire openings and some places to bolt either side of them. Once printed, there's a series of M3 threaded inserts to melt into position, plus four magnets to go into the base and lid. We use some M3 by eight millimeter bolts to put the PCB into position and more of the same size to attach the mount to the base. This slots onto the rear extrusion exactly the same way the old system did. We undo the bolts on one side, loosen them on the other, and then slide it into the center. As promised, the wiring is a lot less complicated. We've got our 24 volts and ground, and we've got a single USB-C cable. The 24 volt cable got a bootlace, and then are secured into the labeled terminals on the left, and the USB-C cable just plugs straight in on the right. Next, I reinstalled and clamped down the piano wire that gives structure to the umbilical, and then set about making the all-in-one cables that go from the bird's nest to each tool head. For this, we need some five core cable, including some shielding like you'd find in a USB cable. This one would be good, except I accidentally ordered too thin a gauge, so I'll just wire up one tool head now as an example. On the tool head side, this is wired up exactly like in the last video. I then ran the cable next to the piano wire and back to the bird's nest to gauge the length and strip back around 40 mils of insulation. Since we're not using a pre-made USB cable, we actually need to use this shielding by soldering a small length of ground wire to it. After this is in place, we can use some heat shrink to tidy everything up. The pins and connectors are included with the bird's nest, so it's just a matter of crimping them on and then inserting them into the connectors. And here is a wiring diagram to match them up exactly. The Molex connector can then be plugged in and then the magnetic lid snaps into position in the most satisfying way. Finally, we set up the firmware. In the manual, there's a section I could skip because I purchased from the store instead of making it myself, but I did follow the steps to flash the latest version of Clipper onto the Bird's Nest MCU. Doing this is exactly like what we did earlier in the video. We're just copying and pasting commands and following instructions. At the end of this, we're going to have a specific serial ID for the new board. We head to GitHub to get the base configuration file. We come to firmware and then nest and download this file. And then in main sale, we can come to upload and select this file to add it to the others. There's a minimum of one edit that we need to make and that's changing the serial ID at the top, pasting in the one that we took from SSH. You'll notice that all of the possible add-ons are already configured. And since you probably don't want all of them appearing in main sale before anything's connected, it makes sense to go through and comment out anything you're not immediately using before you save the file. Finally, we need to put a reference to this file in our main printer.cfg file. Add in an include line and save and restart. At the moment, I'm temporarily back to one toolhead just until the new wiring arrives, but everything is working as it should be. Sometimes you just have to take a step back and fix your foundations before you build any higher. Checking in on our budget, even with the more expensive bird's nest, which I think was totally worthwhile, we're still looking really good compared to a Prusa XL. When the build's done, everything will be documented in a way that's the easiest to follow. That means everything in the best order instead of the order that I've done it. I've got some more test parts to print from DraftShift, so hopefully part four won't be too far away. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.